climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hi there. Welcome to another episode of the Forbidden Limb Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Dan. joined, as always, with Brian Hink and Jeremy Commander. We're going to continue our discussion again this week about how to get ready for a convention, uh, and we will continue that by asking some more questions. Uh, is there any, um, any huge changes you would make, then, for a smaller convention, besides uh, of relaxing your restrictions on what you can bring and put up? Yeah, the um, you're we've been talking about Gen Con, like you've been talking about mostly, big dog. and and yeah, a lot of them just aren't as uh, as critical. Um, you might have less product to sell, so you it's you you have to manage your inventory, um, so you know how much to because it costs a lot of money to to ship your stuff your games to the convention. So figure out for your convention size how many of each game do you need. Um, so that, um, but then also, yeah, you can you can be more flexible. You're probably reusing stuff. You like, I kind of buy things for the bigger convention, and then I'll reuse what I can for the smaller convention, or when I'm just demoing. Speaking of convi- uh, different conventions, then what other conventions can I go to besides game conventions? Mm, comic conventions, anime conventions. Um, they if usually your game have flies. Then yeah, or they usually have. A... Any, you know, would you bring um, New Salem to a? a uh, anime convention. I think this is a huge area of opportunity, and I've seen some other designers and small publishers be very successful with this. Mm-hmm. The convention business is growing. Industry statistics statistics tell us that it's growing by about 20% a year. Mm-hmm. People want experiential entertainment. It's the fastest category mm-hmm. of growing entertainment right now. You see all the, the cosplay exploding on the internet and getting more and more popular. People want to go to the cons and participate in this stuff. And not all cons have a game section, and people like to play new games at a con as part of the experience there. So I have had good success going to anime conventions with Chris Casanetto, and we run a traveling board game library there, and I get to play test some of my prototype games with this wide sample of people uh, that doesn't cost me a lot of money, like going to, say, a Portage Spiel or an Unpub, where I may, it may cost me to, to get in and to travel there, I can go to a local anime con, and run this. Uh, Jonathan, a mutual friend of ours, just did this at Fanime Con and ran a prototype area within the con, and it was an attraction for them. And he gave away little buttons to come play these prototype games. At Sec Anime this year, there was uh, three indie game producers like Brian there with their game in the game room, demoing it and then selling it downstairs so people could learn to play in the game room and then go downstairs and buy it. And their competition was light because it was an anime con. And like Gen Con, where there's eight bazillion different right. games competing for your time and attention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they did pretty well with that methodology. If your game has a theme, going to a con that matches that theme is a huge opportunity. Yep. Let's say you have a Cthulhu game. Mm-hmm. You take that to a Lovecraft con, mm-hmm. right? Let's say you have a steampunk game. There are steampunk cons, and you take it there. And now steampunk f- fans are hungry for something that's in their, their genre, mm-hmm. in their, like, oh, this is cool, a steampunk game. Sign me up for that, and you can hit an untapped market yep. that may not be saturated already, especially because yes. there's you know, 200 games a month hitting Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. You can stand out. like You be the, might be the only guy there with a game at that con. That if you fit thematically, that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, that, that's, that's what's appealing to me as a publisher. Is to, I would, I would uh, be able to reach people that I never would through the normal tabletop gaming channels. Um, yeah, so that, that's one thing we, uh, all, a long time ago before we uh, became real, uh, designers or publishers, we did a, a game about taxidermy, and so I went. I started going to like you know taxidermy forums and like trying to get into that community to try to learn more about it. And uh, you know they have conventions for that kind of thing too. And so that that was something I was looking into back then. Um, so it's it's something that it, I know um, uh, Teal Fristo too. He did a game about bird watching. Yeah. And so he's been trying to to reach that market as well. And so there's a lot of those conventions you could go to too. I know a small indie publisher who has done this successfully and actually designed or licensed some of his game products specifically to give them something to sell that was relevant to that local con. Mm-hmm. Because in my area, there's a Cthulhu con, there's a Steampunk con, there's this. So I'm going to mod- retheme this game mm-hmm. with Steampunk or Cthulhu so I have an excuse to take it to this con and reach this audience, this reach this market that is not tapped into. Yep. Now I understand you guys both have a top five for uh, uh, things that you should make sure you prep. Uh, I mean, we talked about prep this entire episode, but... Um, uh, you have it from the, the publisher 
perspective, and you have it from a designer perspective. So who wants to go first? You go first. No, number one, sell sheets. If I have a game as a designer that I'm going to be pitching to publishers, that game needs that resume. It needs that sell sheet. Mm-hmm. And we I talked about this many times. Have a quick description of the game, the type of game that you're playing, the theme, the the uh, number of players, time, how much. Luck, other stuff like that. Right on. Yep. You, you've been paying attention. I have. We've <laughs> talked about this so many times. Yeah. Uh, in paper form and in PDF form. In okay. case they want just an email it to someone, an electronic copy of your run out, you can go, go to Kinko's and run more off from the PDF form. So the That's number one idea. thing is sell sheet, the resume for your game. Uh, number two, your, your rules. Your rules ready to go and in PDF form because the publisher is interested in your game and they go, okay, I see the sell sheet, send me the rules. And I'll read the rules and see if I want to play your game or arrange a demo. And that's something I get asked for often. So I need to have my rules written well, and in PDF form I can easily send off to someone from my phone or whatever. Uh, and that's the second. Do you have printed off copies as well in case they want to get it that way? I, I, I do have printed copies of my rule with me, but usually I don't, I don't get asked for that. I usually okay. get asked for an electronic copy or someplace I can go and you know, download the rules or look at it that way. Okay. Uh, and so the, I do have paper copies just in case. Or with a PDF, I can print it and stop by the booth, like, oh, you asked for these? Here, I went to Kinko's, print the rule, here they are. Uh, multiple copies of your game. If you are going to be shopping that game to publishers, don't bring just one copy of your prototype. I've made this mistake before, and I had multiple people interested, and maybe that interest cooled, or I lost it because I only had one copy to give out. So I need to have multiple copies. If I think I need two or three copies of each game, oh, you're interested here, I'll give you this copy to take and evaluate and see what you think of the game. Because that gives me a competitive edge. The other guy has one copy, doesn't give it out. I have multiple copies, I give it out, and now that publisher takes it back to his hotel room and plays it with his crew that night, like, oh, this this is a good game, we should sign this game. Mm -hmm. Versus the other guy hasn't even looked at it yet, it's out of sight, out of mind. Make sure that game is done, too. Because I I know I've, I've had some designers kind of approach me about a game, and... I look at it and play it, and they're like, oh, yeah, I mean, there's a balancing issue over here, and this isn't working, and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, well, why am I even playing it? You know, Correct. like, make sure your game is done and ready before you give it to a publisher there. And I mean, they're probably talking, like, GameCraft, or, you know, like, have a, a nice version printed, or are you not That's up to you. I make mine by hand, yeah, because it's cheaper fine. than GameCrafter. I mean, okay. it's sleeved over paper sure. and on, like, you know, on top of magic cards, or uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and the publisher just, they want to evaluate the game. They're not really, they're not judging your art. Okay. And so they want to play the game, and a, a playable copy is of use to them. Yeah. Doing a Game Crafter is great. If your game is really that done done, then fantastic. Yeah. Uh, then do a Game Crafter copy. But that can be kind of expensive, depending on how, the number of components in your game. But so it is, does save you time. If you just, you know, it order, saves your time. if you do, the, do it through there, you can order 10 copies, bring, uh, you know, 10 copies in your backpack. Yeah. You'll hand those out left and right. Maybe a little bit of spit and polish looking, you know, game going on there, maybe. Looks a little more professional. Yeah. Uh, for past the pain, I brought 12 copies to BGG Con and, and gave them out. And I had multiple hits. I had multiple publishers come back to me and say, hey, we played your game, we liked it, we want to talk about it. Uh, but I had already signed it. I said, one publisher at the con has played it and like, all right, we're going to sign this right now. We're done, we're done. <laughs> so Frank at R&R Games was like, nope, tell, tell, do you bring multiple copies? I said, yes. Tell the other guys it's already signed. <laughs> and they're like, okay. Yeah. And that, that was done. So, But the multiple copies was very useful. Uh, contacts in advance. A lot of publishers want you to reach out to them before the con. Uh, so like Zem of Seaman has asked this and others, so that you go through their website and contact them or on Twitter or something like that and say, hey, I have a game that I think would be a good fit for your company. I want to show it to you at Gen Con. Can I make an appointment? And typically they ask you to reach out to them a week or two in advance of the con, and now they know I'm coming, and if Brian has very limited time at Gen Con, because he's selling games and running on his booth, the fact that I got on his dance card early means he's more likely to see me or make time for me because I asked him ahead of time. And he, he, he looked at it, he could even scream me. He goes, oh, you know, I'm not looking for any dice games right now or card games. or yeah. that, That's not a good fit. And now I'm only I'm following up for things that, be, oh, yeah, we, we do want to look at that. Yep. Okay. Uh, and lastly, uh, this is a tip I got from one of my, my con buddies. I think it's great, so I'll share with you prepping for a con. Set aside some of your old clothes. Uh, so, like, let's say your, your NASA shirt there that Richard is wearing is starting to get pretty faded. Like, ah, this shirt is near the end of its life cycle this is here. It's brand new, actually. It's brand new. <laughs> yeah. I bought it like this. It's, it's the Stonewash one. Anyway, anyway. So, I have I, my, my, my Gen Con 2012 shirt sure. or whatever. I take, I take those and I pack those for the con. They, should, they shouldn't look ratty, right? You want to look nice. But these are close, you know, the life cycle. And then I, I throw them away at the con. 
I chuck them there because now I get all that space in my suitcase to bring back more games. I've heard. Uh, I used to go to uh, Gen Con with a bunch of people that would always pack, um, you know, like a, a, a duffel bag, and yeah. they'd roll it up and they put it in their backpack. So they would bring home multiple bags, and so it, you know, just pack other bags inside your bags. And part of why I fly Southwest because I can check two bags for free. So I have a bag in the bag, and coming back, I can check two bags, and I throw away card, my club old clothes, and I can I can buy more games. Is that your five? That's my five. All right, all right. So I'll go from the the publisher perspective now. Um, so one thing, um, have a strategy for the convention. What are you trying to do there? Are you trying to scout games? Do you or do you have do you have a full plate already? You're not worried about that. You're trying to maybe demo games. Are you gaming for a Kickstarter? Is that is that where you want to put your focus? Um, so. Um, just strategize. That's the biggest thing. Don't have put a goal. too much on your plate. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and know what you're going after. Because at a convention, you can attack it from so many different angles. Yep. But as a small publisher, you don't have time to do that. So you need to choose one or two things to really hit. Um, and so that's that's the most important thing to have that plan up front. That's really good advice. Can I, can I piggyback on that? As a designer, yeah. I should decide, am I going to this con to play test or to pitch. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier, you know, don't show me a game that's not done. It's not ready. I'm wasting your time. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, if I'm not ready, then my goal for the con should be to play test, to get other designers to look at it. Maybe I show it to a publisher who's got time and I say, this game's not ready yet, but I want your opinion and I want your feedback on it. Yeah. And so now I'm telling you it's not done. I'm not yeah. wasting your time. So yes. decide, I, I try to now decide, am I going to pitch or am I going to play test? So I go to Unpub and Protospiel to play test and I go to Gen Con to pitch. Mm -hmm. And that's my, my plan. So that's number, that was number one. Um, so number two is uh, just knowing the format of the con. Um, and it, it go, it's related to number one because, um, so you can, for like a smaller convention, you can have a booth there. You can go get a booth and have people come to you. Um, or you can run events. And I can spend all my time scheduling events. It's a small mm -hmm. local cons. That's what I do. So I have uh, an event for each of our games every day. So you can play Good Cop, Bad Cop on, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And same for New Salem, same for Booze Baron, same for all of them. So then th that's how I do it for the smaller con. Uh, because I just don't want to have a booth and just sit there, you know, people might not come by. It's just, right. I feel like a better use of my time is to be there demoing the game myself. And then making, you know, making sure that I have a retailer um, in the vendor hall that has copies of my game. So I'll, I might even just bring my copies myself. Here, here's a stack of my games. Uh, go sell them. Take your fifty percent cut. Um, I just want somebody there who's going to be able to sell my game after I demo it for them. And so you can find a vendor to do that. Um, I'll also do that. I know lots of small indie guys who may rely on a partner to sell their games. Yeah. They don't have a booth, mm -hmm. and they go and then do just tournaments and learn to play for their games. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, I teach you to play, or you play in the tournament. You like the game, you go in and you go buy it for my partner. I didn't have to pay for a booth and rent tables and do all that. And I get that sale through doing the Learn to Play events. Yep. And so in know, so know what the con is all about because one work is going to work better for another. You know, we're going to go to San Diego Comic Con. There, you know, I don't want a booth there because, yeah. like, it's not is it's not a focused tabletop gaming right. convention. But I do want events there, and I so I, I'm going to go there to demo events, and that's kind of my main focus there. So it really depends on. And, and a local con, people may not go to buy; they may go to play, yeah. right? And the vendor yeah. hall may be really small. Mm -hmm. So if I'm running events, people are like, oh great, I get to play this game, mm -hmm. and that may be more valuable to them than a booth that they like. Ah, I didn't go to the vendor hall when I go to the local con. So that's number two. Um, number three um, is to have at least one promo. A lot of people really like these promos. Or, you know, by, by promo, it could be a promo card. It could be, I mean, probably some, some something for a game, you know, that will go in the game and maybe improve or make your copy unique. Um, but people will be drawn to you for promos. And so that's good. It could also be a giveaway, you know, a promotional, like, you can win a copy of this. But have something like that that, that will get those people who want, want stuff, you know, okay. to go find you. Um, give them a reason to come 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 to you. <clears throat> Number four, um, so make some really cool signs. I mean, they can be expensive, but you can reuse them. Um, so and they can be you know fairly cheap too. You know we talked about the you know uh, eleven by seventeen sign you can get for twenty bucks, but it looks great. It makes you look more professional. You can put it up on a on a table and uh, and yeah and and it'll it'll make people want to come and play that game because you're not you know. You you just look a little more professional, I think, when you when you have something. Make it look nice and reusable, and yeah. then you get a lot of use out of that. Yeah. Really, you know, fairly expensive, but you know it, you get a lot of use out of that, so yep. you get a lot of life out. Yep. Of it. Yep. Right. Uh, last one, number five. 
Um, this has become more important. Um, I, I've realized how important it is to a publisher, and that's to find a way to get, you know, to, to at least give someone the option of, of joining your mailing list. Because you do a lot of Kickstarter campaigns. Yeah. So it's very important for you to build up mm -hmm. a, a list of people that are interested in your games. Yep, that's incredibly valuable. For our, for our games, pretty much the only survey question is, hey, do you want to be on our mailing list? You know, and that, that's it. It's all, I, it's all I really, you know, care about. If you want to hear more about our games, join that way. But at, at a convention, you're meeting so many people, so you have a very quick way to get their email address, whether it's, um, you know, a business side card slip of paper and, and plenty of pens so they can just write down their email address, give it to you. Um, it could be a, um, you know, a way, a laptop or a tablet or a laptop where they can type in their email address. But just a really quick way to do that if they want to know more about you. There's a, you, know, you have to do it in a way that like doesn't seem you know too 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 spammy either. Mm -hmm. So just be careful about how you approach someone. You know, be like, hey, can I you know get your information you know, and so I can contact you. You know, like that that sounds kind of like very invasive. You know, yeah. if, you're, if I'm just minding my own business, yeah. <laughs> no, right, right. Um, so is there a way to entice people into giving you that information a little bit uh, more? Um, I, I, what I usually do is if I'm demoing a game, you know, I just have a stack of, of something and maybe some pens and be like, hey, if you want to know more uh, about this game or you want to know when this it's you had a good experience, yeah, write it down. But I always like say like you completely do not have to. I'd not be offended if you do not. Okay. So. I don't want to miss out on stuff that happens game wise. So I have an email address that just signs up for board game related stuff and gets a big pile of board game related emails. And it's not my personal email, yeah. so I can ignore it if I choose to. Right. But then that way, you know, if something comes up, something's on sale, there's a promotion, like I get to vote on how this game is going to be made, I don't want to miss out on that. So I want to be on that mailing list with that chance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you guys both for giving me those great. Top five lists and all the other information that we've talked about for getting ready for a convention. Uh, I want to thank you guys for joining us today. This has been the Forbidden Limb Podcast. I'm your host, Richard New, and I'm here with Jeremy Commander and Brian Hink, as always. Uh, if you want to contact us, give us feedback or any other information or any other uh, suggestions for things you want us to talk about, you can join, uh, you can check out our guild on uh, the Board Game Geek. To the boardgamegeek.com. Yeah. If you're going to be at Gen Con, look up Overworld Games. Yes. It'll be on the, in the program. You yeah. can find yeah. where he is at that point. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, thank you guys for joining us, and we'll see you guys across the table someday. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.